Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Hello, it is Ryan. And we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. So welcome, Jesse V. Johnson, to the World of Martial Arts Television to talk about Boudicca. What a film about the almost mythical yet very real warrior queen who nearly 2,000 years ago led an army of British tribes against the obscenely cruel Roman occupation. It's incredibly different to Avengement Debt Collector, Hell Hath No Fury. How did you come to make this movie? Feels a very different, different sort of thing for you. It, it different, but it's a continuation, you know, of, of themes, I think. And I had this script that I had attempted to finish and attempted to lick and attempted to sort of get made for probably about a decade or more, actually more than that, because it's uh, been lingering a long time. And it was the story of Boudicca. Uh, and it was something I knew I felt very, very passionate about and wanted to do. It was a story that, for some reason, I'd been drawn to uh, since since I was a, a, a kid and sort of had seen the statue and, and learned a little bit about her plight. Uh, and there was something so terribly heartbreaking about it, but so justified in what she did. Uh, and that's an interesting thing, I, I, you know, to, to articulate what it was that that truly drew me to the character. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, perhaps an amalgam of of the English character, sort of messed up and you know put together in this this character that that you know typified uh something that frustrated me but anyway i couldn't finish the script it was it was a uh you know you have this middle act which was very very difficult to handle it's not really made for cinema or or tv or you know it's it's unfilmable if you did it even remotely close to what actually happened and so this half written script had sort of languished for about a decade and after working with with olga i had a sense of perhaps being able to you know, come up with a way of finishing it, perhaps being, you know, there was something there that could work that could, that, you know, she was an actress of, of range and depth and emotion who could bring that. And perhaps there was enough there that would inspire me to come up with a way to finish it, to, to, to handle that middle act, to handle that sort of, uh, 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 you know, switch. And, and, you know, I, I took the script out and read it and read it and read it. And it sort of came, came to me as, as, uh, you know, and, and, once I had figured out how to handle that dramatically, the rest of the script was very, very quick and it, it wrote itself pretty efficiently because it was a subject matter I'd been deeply researching for a long, long time, attempting to work out how to finish it. So uh, yes, in many ways it is different to the other films I've done, but in many ways it is the absolute essence of the other films I've done as well. Uh, in that you know, it deals with you know the human character, a normal person, not necessarily a, a person who's a you know, martial artist or an ex special forces or any of these other, you know, hitmen, you know, on the run, just a normal person who's pushed to the very brink of their sanity uh, to get redemption, you know, of, of, of a sort. And this is something that I find rather interesting, you know. And if you think of Avengement, he's really a normal sort of fella. His brother was the gangster. He was yes. he was a, a very normal kind of guy and actually quite nice, uh, who was pushed, pushed to becoming what he came by by you know spending time wrongly in prison and the 
it, you know, the, the, so it's not terribly dissimilar. If you look for a theme, I wouldn't look for a theme and I hate to ever think that I was making films of the same theme over and over. Although I think there was a director who said every director makes the same film over and over. Uh, but, but I'm, I'm not that one, hopefully. Uh, so it was really working with Olga again that, that triggered the script and it got finished. And, and then uh, it was a strange sort of, you know, I went to, funnily enough, the finances, you know, of Avengement who had worked with me before. They loved the idea of doing a film with Olga, but also Ariel Blyberg, who is the son of Ehud Blyberg that runs Blyberg International, with whom I'm friends now after five or six movies, successful movies, uh, is, a, is a big history buff as well. And, and which is very rare for an American to know anything about Boudicca. Most of the time they mispronounce it, misspell it and, and, and misquote it and have really very little knowledge of her. And that's not any, any, any snub against the Americans. It's a very English piece of history. And, uh, uh, so it came together well. I did take it out to a few other producers in America, and the first, you know, the overriding reaction was, "But she loses," uh, and uh, you know, is there any way of making her win? Can can we can we have her beat the Romans? So it that wasn't going to work. So I kept coming back to Blyberg. They they they, you know, the budgets are lower, but they give me artistic freedom, and they understood that she, you know, that, that this is this is a film about someone that was important because she didn't win that's the whole that that it, win is a you know is a it's not the term to use in terms of this but that's not a spoiler they got it and they understood it but it was a sub it was a subject matter that was tough as i say it was it's it's absolutely un-american in terms of you know uh following the hero and, and having them not make it through you know alive to the last act uh but then it's absolutely american in in the underdog coming through and taking on the the bigger one so i i don't think of it as a, as a, a national one but i i think that i think the course of events looking back on it sort of makes sense as to how buddha came to being uh and it is sort of an extension of those other movies uh but really it was olga that that, that triggered it and working with her olga kurilenko glows as the warrior queen and you did create the movie with her in mind is there any sense that she is channeling the current situation that's happening in her own own country now against the Russian invaders? I, I'm I'm aware of of that and what she had done and you know and how her feelings are, which are very personal to her. And, you know, I met with her in Paris initially to tell her about the film and pitch it to her and give her some of my drawings and what I told her. I didn't think it would be appropriate. I thought it would be grossly vulgar of a director to say, look. This is exactly what's going on in Ukraine. Try and channel that, and 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 that's not what I wanted either. I, this is not a political film. This is nothing to do with politics. Anyone who knows me knows I'm pretty apolitical. I'm, you know, uh, it's I don't believe in in the following of a large group. <laughs> that's just not my not my thing. And I wouldn't use something as vulgar as that to to create a, an artistic work. I I think that would be wrong. Having said that, she got. The similarities and she brought them up and she mentioned them to me uh and i found that interesting uh but this was a very personal film and, and based on a historical you know fact as much as i possibly could it was, it was tenuous to be honest and you know multiple opinions and different uh romans said different things you know uh, and they weren't really there they were there 52 years, you know, talking to people years after the fact, even though people say they were first hand witnesses. But that aside, uh, I know she was aware of it. I know there was a lot of that in there. But for housewife with two beautiful daughters whose main interest in life was looking after those daughters and seeing that they grew up in a healthy, educated and principled manner. Uh, and then getting her nails done, getting her hair done, buying clothing uh, and enjoying life in very much the same way as a mother and daughters would in, in today's world which which the more you dig away at roman society the more you realize oh my gosh this is this is really a mirror on how we are now you know it, they had special nails that you know nail varnish that was brought in makeup that was brought from there you could buy it very expensively those perfumes they were, the, the way the hair was worn was changing every every you know six months to nine months the fashions it was a it was an extraordinarily, you know, uh, similar to, to to how how people live their lives now, uh, and I we both wanted to touch on that as much as possible. And when it came to the mother aspect of uh, the Queen's character, I leant very heavily on Olga, who is a who is a very good mother. She has a has a son who and, and and takes that very very seriously. And I said, look, 
I'm, you know, I'm going to let you, you know, lead the way in this, this, on this part of the film, because I, you know, I, this is something you're far more familiar with. I have, I've, you know, I have, I have children, but I'm not a mother and I wanted it to be as authentic as possible. And there was a lot of, what would you in this, if you do in this scenario, how do you feel about this? How would you, you know, talk to the kids here? Would you grab them? And so I, I, I lent very heavily on her, which she enjoyed. I, I think uh, she really liked having that sort of authorship and agency. Uh, but then after the event happens, uh, that's when I felt I could step in and, and that's very much that's very much my thumbprint on the on the warrior side. Although having said that, Olga, by that point in the game, because we shot as, as close to continuity order as possible. The eyebrows went, there were scars, the hair was very different. There were certain aspects of the character I didn't want to have to flick back to on any given day or even any given two days to, for that matter. It, it, it was such a deep sort of immersion to make these two people work seamlessly, but not have it become a parlor trick, you know? One is a normal woman that you might run into in Beverly Hills or London or, you know, or, or Paris, chattering away with the daughters. Boring. And, and the, the next one is is akin to commando leader, you know, and it's, you know, and thinking about how to best, you know, punish the enemy, not defeat the enemy, but punish them and teach them a lesson. And this is a slightly different, you know, in you know, an English one wing commando or SAS, this is not what they do. It's not to punish. And what Buddha does is she wants to punish the Romans. She wants to teach them a lesson uh, that will resonate in history. And it really did. It resonated in history, literally and figuratively. If you know, if you talk to archaeologists and you know, the sites that she burned, there's a layer of black with, with a sand and to a black molten glass that they that they know was AD 61. That was the era that she burned the city. And 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 so she she left her mark. And this is something that we we both wanted to sort of show the two very very different sides to us. that was important we tried to, as i said we tried to keep politics out of it as much as possible you know it was uh, uh or we didn't even try it it wasn't even a factor having said that it's interesting that olga is ukrainian and the the, the, the Boudicca sword the brass sword that we had specially made even though it said new york when i when i ordered it, it actually came from you came as well it was held up for six weeks in donbass which i guess is a shipping zone we, we we'd go online to see how, how far away it was and it just it was <laughs> It's just dead. It finally turned up in in Los Angeles, and then to get it from Los Angeles to England became a a trial. But it arrived, I think, uh, something like twelve hours before we started filming. We had the sword, and it, it was there. It got to the point where we couldn't replicate it and make it film. So it was a it was a quite an interesting process. So both Queen and Sword were from the Ukraine. For what that is worth. Coming on to the sword, um, uh, particularly the way it comes alive in her hands, is and it almost feels like it's a reference to that King Arthur and and sword in a stone type of uh, reference. Is was that intentional or was that sort of a hundred percent completely? I think uh, you're dealing with you know when you're dealing with that era of humans, they didn't have a basis for well that's real or that's not real or that's mythological. That wouldn't happen. This is what really happens in the real. The two worlds interceded and and crossed over so much, you know, uh whether it was pagan religions, druidism or 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 the new fan, you know, the new Christianity or or anything else that they followed, you know, the multiple religions that were coming out of uh, Rome at the time. It, you 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 it would be perfectly normal to have something like that happen. You know, if someone walked through with a cell phone, they would probably be more accepting of that than we would of something we saw because we are so obnoxiously self-confident and thinking we understand the universe around us. When in actual fact, there are things that are that that, that are indescribable and magical and mythical that that happen every day. You know, but we brush them off as coincidence or or freaks of nature or because we are you know we live in this this strange era of 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 arrogance, but uh. They didn't then, and and so you know, a, a sword that might glow, that might vibrate, that might have a ability to heal itself. You know, this is this is something that would have been completely possible then, it would not have been outside of the realms of reason. Did it really happen? I'm not sure, but that's certainly how the person that told me it happened happened. You know, oh, well, was, it works. It works. He was telling me exactly what he saw. That's, that's sort of what we wanted of the story. And I said, no one must react to anything here as if it's something strange. When she's talking to her children, uh, we, we, you know, uh, and, and there's no one there. We told, you know, 35 extras, it's nothing. You know, she's your warrior leader. She's seeing you through, uh, she's seeing you through the most awful times. You're going to let her have the odd idiosyncrasy. That's okay. She does that. 
you know, I've worked with directors who chew things and, and, and make complete fools themselves, but you have 150 people who set who will treat them as that as if that's absolutely okay. Why? Because they have the power of personality at that moment. And they are the they are the king in the room and you you let that go, you know. Uh it's part of their idiosyncrasy. You know, Mad as a Hatter, but he directs a great movie. And this this is, you know, military. I've I've heard stories of of you know, warrior leaders who, who you know carry you know umbrellas into combat or, or you know wear bow and arrow on their backs it's silly things but it's it's the soldiers let them off with it because not only was it odd but it set them apart and it gave them something to talk about and 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 i think i think it was important to me that nothing was handled no one said anything wow that's magical i think one of the characters says did you just see what i saw and they said yeah don't worry about it he said okay then i won't worry about it you know i thought that was the best way to handle the magic happening you know people are we, we we write things off very very quickly if you took 30 people in a train that had never seen a sub you know never seen a cell phone before and someone walked in with a cell phone and started talking on it uh and some one person said what's that and he said oh you're reading the newspapers that we 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 are humans we don't you know we don't like to jump around point and scream and make fools of ourselves if everyone else is sort of taking something we go along with it and i felt that was you know, so we talked to the cast about that a lot ahead. So, yes, the sword was magical, but it was just one of those other things that happened when Boudicca was around. You know, things were a little odd when she was there, but boy, she 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 was a warrior leader. You know, she she was you know, she was doing things that no one had done before. So, sort of, sort of referring back to sort of the sort of the grittiness of uh, avengement and the the sort of street qualities of debt collector and that sort of stuff. Um, yet yeah, this Boudicca. It's beautifully, sumptuously shot, with sort of definite look. To me, it feels like to Gladiator, particularly the to the, the, the beginning of the film where it's all that sort of idyllic, bucolic, lovely uh, life that then is so tragically changed. Was that a, a, an intentional thing, or was it just sort of happenstance? It, well, thank you very much. That's those are lofty uh, films to be look like. I mean, uh, it it was i painted the imagery in this film <laughs> i've never i did that when i first did my first short movie years ago i storyboarded the whole film and they got frustrated because somewhere along the line the screen direction changed which meant the rest of the script was the rest of the storyboard which had taken me days to do uh, the characters all pointing the wrong way in the conversations and i had to keep saying no 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 they're looking the other way don't worry and then you know we'd have second unit dps that were setting up shots and everything was and so from that point on i said i will never storyboard the whole movie or sketch pictures again or do anything i'll just do them very quickly the night before with overheads which i like and i move very quickly with those and if anything changes you simply you know you simply redo it and you don't feel it you but but on this one, i went back to what i'd done for my first movies which is painting with watercolors with with sketch you know pencils and, and drawing these from the makeup through to the sets and i knew that the beginning of the film when she was the queen and the mother was going to have a particularly golden green shoe to it. I worked with Jonathan Hall, who's a tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, DP that I've worked, you know, cinematographer I've worked with many times. And we pulled a lot of references and said, look, you know, everything's going to be greener than usual, lush, you know, uh, alive, you know, full of, full of promise and, 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 you know, richness. You could reach in, up into the tree and grab a fruit out of it and eat it. That's, you know, they're pushing flowers where they weren't. And, which wasn't difficult because it was that beautiful English summer when, you know, in the shade, everything just grew. There were bluebells and, and succulents and it was, you know, breathtaking. And it, you never see it. You also remember England as being this way. We got extraordinarily lucky because of where we shot. Uh, and then after the act happens, we knew that we wanted to turn that on its head as much as possible. And, you know, and things would be browner, dirtier, darker. And, 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 and you know, it's, it sounds basic describing it now, but, but it, you know, we, we tried to put as much thought into that as possible. And, and really show the progression from a visual and color standpoint so that the audience, even if they didn't quite put their thumb on what was going on, they could feel the descent into this darkness that comes with, you know, with with her sort of uh, journey. And, uh, you know, he's he's very good at that. And then color correction was wonderful. Uh, we, had, we had a spectacular uh, company in Los Angeles that did wonderful work with that and really got in. We could, you know, we could, we could color sections of sky and, and help with clouds and give them richness, which was, which was, you know, I've never really done it to that degree before, and it was fun to work that way. You know, with with the pictures, as I'm sure you're aware, the debt collectors and the avengement. These pictures were shot in three weeks. You know, 18 days, and you're out there, and you gam, and you're doing the equivalent of, you know, you know, the other guys that are working on that same budget. Are, you know, the films and, you know, there's considerably less care shown for them. Uh, 
So it was nice to do something where it was truly about how the film looked and really sink all of those sort of uh, underlying visual traits into it. Uh, so thank you for noticing. I believe you, you shot it on, on location, a tough call in any place, and it was Suffolk, but um, what was it like in, being in Suffolk, it being the land where it actually happened? Uh, initially, we were aware that it was close to, you know, which is very close to Sutton Hoo, and that, that part of England is very rich in a wonderful history, especially in military history. Uh, but as as we sort of started, you know, building and, and you know, the, the, the crown hog and, and sort of scouting the various areas around where he'd been, he brought me a big box and said, these are these are Roman artifacts that my family have found over the years, plowing the fields and there were little coins and, and bits of glass and sort of, you know, good luck charms that... that uh, and the realization that we're actually very, very close to where she may have galloped and slept and camped and raided became, you know, quite apparent. And it was it had a sort of profound effect on me and not that it influenced the film. We didn't choose to shoot there because of that reason. There were multiple reasons that that, that saw us filming in, in, in this property. But it was. It, it added to the sense of responsibility. You know, you're taking a historical character, an actual person responsible to my characters as possible. I don't want to make them look foolish. I, this is not about a quick money grab. This is not about, you got to make a movie because we've got to fill the time slot here and make that work over there. I've, there are movies that exist like that. I've worked on them. I've, you know, I've done a lot of films as a stuntman. I've done a lot of films as an assistant director and a you know, second unit director. This was a film that, that I felt I owed this burden of responsibility. I, and there was a reason it had taken 20 odd years to get the film together and financed and ready to go. Uh, and I didn't want to do something that would make her look wrong, that, that would let her down. And, and and I think by being where she had perhaps been, and maybe it's an English, senti uh, Irish sentimental kind of thing where you read you, you read messages and, and you know, mythology into everything, but, but certainly it made me feel a lot more on a bound to treating her legend as as well as I possibly could, as truthfully and as as, as responsibly as I could. Uh, so we were shooting there, and I think that that spread amongst a lot of the crew. It certainly did to all that we talked about it at quite length, uh, and it and it reached a pinnacle. Uh, actually, not at Julian's property at Bentwaters, which is an old military base and ancient oak wood. That you walk around there, and you feel the history of England seeping through you, the smells and the looks, and you realise this: you you could have been someone two thousand years ago, and and their view and their smell and what they were treading on would have been very very similar to what you have right there, almost identical. Uh, and we're giving the, you know, Olga has to give the speech, the speech to the the Iceni, the, the gathered Celts in this final, the final sort of battle, the push against the Romans, and uh, you know, raise the sword and started yelling the speech and giving it fabulous performance. And there was a low rumble behind her, and thunder built up, and then lightning strike, and it cracked as she gave the speech. And we cut, and she came to me and said, "Did you you made the you made the thunder right? That was you." I was like, "No, I didn't at all." And it was one of those moments where there was not really much more to talk about because it was you didn't really want to ruin it in your mind. We've moved on to the next take. The thunder never came again. But there were little moments like that through the shoot that really, really made it rather special, you know. And so you ask, how was it filming so close to where she may have lived? The answer is is so sort of difficult to explain, you know, but I think it helped an immense amount. I think it gave us all a little bit of a... Uh, you know, picked us up a little bit and said, "You're doing something a little special here. You know, do your best. See what you can. You know, don't 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 rush a shot. Don't don't get in there and just shoot it." Which I try not to do ever, but 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 it's you know, she was like perhaps another executive producer standing behind us. A quick question on: You have an outstanding cast: Clive Stanton, Richard Tushingham, James Faulkner, amongst others. But Nick Moran as uh, the baddie, I thought he was superb as a uh, Roman general, if he's a general. Catius Dacianus. Um, how did you get him to find his character so that almost wickedly enjoying his sort of cruelty? I I called and offered Nick a part I thought he would hate. I thought he did, did not want to play the bad guy for me. Nick's desperate to play a you know, really good heroic role again. He deserves it. He's a phenomenal actor, a wonderful human being, extraordinarily intelligent, incredibly talented, far more talented than I am as a writer and a director and an actor. And, you know, I, I just, I'm in awe of him, you know, working with him. I sent him the script. Uh, he instantly said, yes, I'll do it. And he said, which part? And I said, Catus Decianus. And he said, oh my God, it's, oh, I'm so hoping that was what you were going to ask me. So backstory is he was set to, uh, uh, they had, uh, 
Jude Law was going to play Commodus in Gladiator. Jude Law had not heard of Russell Crowe and said, I'm not doing a film with this unknown Australian and backed out. There was a huge rush to find the character, the actor to play Commodus and Ridley Scott's Gladiator. It went out across London. Nick Moran was the front contender at that time. He was a big name. He had just finished Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. He went through several different callbacks. He met Ridley Scott. He went deep, deep into this uh, part and felt he knew it better than anyone else and was very, very good at it. A change of events happened. It went to Joaquin Phoenix. The rest is history. But Nick has carried this in his heart ever since then. And we, we, you know, I asked him the exact same question. I said, "How are you doing this so well? How, where is it coming from? Where, you know, you were born to play this part." And he said, "He, he, he told me the story, and he went into this in great detail, more detail, and, and far more funny and erudite than I am. But it was a beautiful story. And by the end of it, I felt that was a really good, you know." come up and for him and he came back and he got to play this part and i think it's a better part than Commodus anyway i think he came with a ferocious willingness to do a really really good job and to blow everyone else out of the water and show what he could do with that part after 20 years of sort of harboring it actors actors do that they create a part they have to create backstory they have to learn the lines it's not just repeating something you've learned. i mean you know this of course but you get deeply involved in a part like that when you're reading for someone like ridley scott you're going to do enormous research you're going to you're going to make sure there's 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 onion layers to the, to him when you're in there reading in front of him, and that 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 character's been in him waiting waiting to come out. So he burst forth like alien, you know, in the other Ridley Scott movie, and he he came out and saw him come to life. So I, I found it really exciting to hear that. I didn't know until he told me sort of midway through, and then it also it all sort of you know the Makes dots joined so to speak. Yeah, cool. I love um, when he meets on the path and gives that speech to it. The lighting there was crazy. The light that was you know coming through the trees it was uh really quite quite eerie you know eerie, yes yeah there yes was, was something wonderful about it there's a couple of moments when you're making historical pieces like this and you've deeply immersed yourself in the period you've read all the books you've got reenactors there that you've you've had long meetings over coffee with talking about what would and what wouldn't uh you've watched other movies uh documentaries i find the books the best because for some reason i retain information from a piece of paper with maybe it's the generation i came from but certainly talk, ha having these people there so you've you've immersed yourself in it and you're standing in the middle of the woods surrounded by roman soldiers and boudicca's there and there's something magical about that it's something it's the most incredible way to make a living <laughs> you're time traveling you know uh, with oh, these beautiful people, with these beautiful creatives and you're there to do something to entertain it is just wonderful you know this it's you know so i hope people enjoy this movie i truly do i, I put i put an enormous amount into it and at the end of the day i feel there's not much more i could have done i left it all out there there wasn't any stone left unturned the budget was not as huge as we'd all have liked and it was, it was draining and grueling but i think what what we managed to pull off i'm very proud of so you know how did you train the actors and choreograph the fight scenes Obviously, the Roman legionaries were hugely impressive in their gorgeous kit. Um, did they come back ready in that they knew how to fight in formation, that type of thing? And then how did you train the Britons on the other side to fight a shield wall and, and do what they had to do? Because that looked all incredibly convincing and wasn't sort of just put together. It looked like they were really going at it. Funnily enough, the guys that I had on Avengement were Dan Stiles, who's an English stunt coordinator, has a wonderful team and network of, of stunt men in in the UK and Ireland and then I brought Luke Lafontaine who's my regular collaborator from the US uh to England they'd worked together previously on Avengement and then you know Dan had also done a uh, accident man and one ranger for me uh Luke had also done all of the US films I did so when I put their heads together they they argue with each other a lot but they they come up with really really interesting creative ideas and solutions and you know, get very involved in training the guys and researching and out foxing the other person on what they've discovered and what they found and what particular sword technique was used and, and, and you know, could be utilized in the film. And it becomes like a game, you know, almost almost nerd, bordering on nerdish as to, you know, Luke's father worked for the Metropolitan Museum in, in New York. And so he deeply, deeply ensconced in, you know, and, and and brought up in that way of you know uh, critically thinking about how weaponry was designed around what what use it was intended for and, you know he has a line of knives that he created for cold steel you know which are the lafontaine knives which which bear his name and, and are quite 
quite expensive. Uh, I asked for one for free and he wouldn't give it to me. Uh, but but he he brings that sensibility to it. He's worked with me a long time and knows intrinsically what I want of a scene and how hard I want to push and that I never want the action or the gore or the or the particular weaponry that's being I never want that to take a to outshine my 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 cast. The most important thing is what's going on in the eyes of the cast and where they are. Everything else is should be should be secondary to that, you know. You can, you know, and and he he likes that. And so he did some of the best second unit I've had directed for me on this one. Uh I was very impressed with what he, you know, put together. You know, we went through everything in detail. He he, you know, knew the history. Uh, as did Dan, they worked with the uh, reenactors. They they had access to the same books that I brought to do research, and uh, you know they trained the actors ahead of time in you know in in cardio and uh, how to use the sword the way they would have done, and the particular techniques and where the kill zones were, and 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 what you know, and also to be careful of anachronisms and you know in, in technique, and and uh, then the actors took that upon themselves. Uh, Olga very rarely rehearses. She she's a very quick study and likes to watch the stunt her stunt double work through it, work through it, and then Olga will step in and do it. But it's very complicated on this one because Olga is so energetic. You know, she's so much you know fury she brought to the role. It became very difficult for the stunt double to keep up, and 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 so we tried to use Olga wherever possible to do her own stuff because she just became this furious ball of sort of energy. It didn't hurt anyone uh but 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 it's a it's just a you know theatrics that 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 is not very easy to to replicate uh but yeah she was she she it was a good sport where she was in there she was training and she was hitting the ground and rolling and fighting and sweating and you know having to be reminded to breathe as she was, was doing all the fight scenes and uh and really got into it which is great i tried to distance myself from that I, I spent you know decades as a stuntman and I loved it. It was wonderful to me. I made a lot of money doing it and enjoyed it and got to work with some fantastic people. But at this point in what where I am in my journey, it's it's all about the story and the performance and focusing on those guys. I didn't like directors who got too involved in the action when I was doing the action. So I explain what it is. I pass it across. I watch the videos that they shoot at the rehearsals in great detail. We discuss that. We talk about it. And when they come to set to direct, unless I see something truly going wrong, I let them do it because they have their own method at that point. They've worked with those stunt guys on that sequence for a couple of weeks for me to jump in and then say, no, 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 do it this way. Change that over there. You could you could harm someone. It could throw it off. It could not look realistic. Although sometimes it is just fun to do that regardless. Well, speaking of fun and strange things, is <clears throat> It, it wasn't a tank and it wasn't an RPG or anything like that. It was what was it like working a ballista into the fight action? So that was the key well, thing that Yeah, it was it was really key. And uh we had to talk an awful lot about it. Is it an arrow that hits people and they fall over like in John Wayne movies? Or what does it do? And we we took we went out and had a look at what ballistas did when they fired and this great big bolt. And if it hit you, it, I mean it's an awful I mean it, you know, I don't think physics works quite the same way but but it's a movie as well you know but it certainly would wrench you off your feet you know you know in movies you see people hit with a shotgun and go eight or ten feet now if you were holding the shotgun by laws of newton you'd also go back you know so there's there's things that don't quite quite work oftentimes but you know with artistic license i think the size of the bolt and the you know and the power behind it the kinetic energy of it hitting i think it would not be flying it would take you to pieces it would it would it would disembowel and and hurt and what i didn't want to do with this was a disservice to anyone by sort of you know mimicking that warfare with steel swords is is anything but the most viciously brutal thing imaginable you know you get hit with a, a piece of sharpened metal with the intent of killing you this is awful this is this is beyond description you know i'd, I'd rather i would rather not be shot or killed or hurt at, at all in battle i'd like to die peacefully but I would certainly prefer to be hit by a sniper's round than hit by someone, you know, hitting me with what was probably blunt by that point because it had been used as many times as he could until I stopped moving or he felt he was exhausted and could move on to the next person. If you think of the sheer brutality of it, if you read in PTSD, it's this close combat which affects you the most, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the man who presses the button being the least all the way through to the person who has to stab the other person with a bayonet being the worst. You know, you, you are... This is this is what they did, and and I didn't want to weaken that. You know, it, it had to be shown, it had to be felt, 
especially by that point in the movie you know it was it was intrinsic that it was not handled in a way that you know it's people on stage combat touching the swords at the top and then turning and doing the points of the compass and then whoosh and a nice bloodless stab in the heart and he falls down and wants to the next guy this is this is not what sword fighting is about it it, it absolutely uh is the embodiment of the term you know you have a great plan until you meet in combat and it all goes out the window there is no plan no plan survives combat you know and and this this is this is what it is you just hit at any opening that you could see you know uh which brings which, which um brings it to the, sort of the, another question thought is um uh that end fight scene when it all comes the, the sort of t together um uh, has a, a whiff of Tarantino, but much more that sense of pecking pie you mentioned earlier, and that that sense of awful, violent element of glory to it, because she is reeking, they are reeking what they can on the Romans. And um, was that is that was that me reading into it, or were you channeling a bit of pecking pie and and cross of iron? Uh, I, I adore pecking pie. I love him. I do like cross of iron. My favourite is is the least popular amongst people, but you have to be a peck and power aficionado to love it. Is remember the head of Alfredo Garcia? Yes. The um, peck and power was my film school. My first, I was working as a PA on Shawshank Redemption and realized I wanted to make a career of this. And I bought the first biography I bought was a Sam Peck and one. I have I have eleven of them now. I adore Peck and You know, every single one of his biographies has this terrible, sad last act, of course, which breaks your heart because it was a you know it drove himself into the uh, into the asphalt but uh Tarantino I love as well uh I don't think I think you have to be very careful of ever touching that territory because in the moment you step there it instantly becomes you know he's got such a signature on all of his work which is glorious and wonderful and fantastic to watch but you don't want to copy it you don't want to you don't want to even be inspired by it you have to put that stuff aside uh I love Peck and Parr to say that that had reeked into my work in some way would would be obvious and would would I would imagine it but I didn't really want to copy anyone I didn't really feel inspired by any other movie but the books that we were reading on on what warfare was like at that time and 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 there were certain images that i had in my head her kneeling you know chopping the sword off you know and 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 standing and facing them that, that were images that had sort of clouded and come into your head but you know the truth of the matter is if you watch enough movies they've you know where your real memories into you know converge with what you've watched or read over the years becomes very difficult to to this you know make distinction of and I, I think uh you have to be very careful what you watch if you're a filmmaker you know especially one you know who works slightly on on the edge of emotions and you know and you know as i do and it's like uh i try to immerse myself in an older era of movies 50s and 60s and, and 80s maybe maybe 80s uh but really just just living there robin and mary and i loved watching what you know it was a huge influence on this one and you because then if anything finds its way into your work it's less obvious you know uh what, what the, this whole sentence reeks of plagiarism but the point is if you if you're going to let stuff seep into your work which you really have no control over try and make it for try and make it richard lester try try and make it Ralph walsh hawks uh you know the, these Kazan, Kurosawa, these great masters. And for me, that's a safer ground. And that stuff plays interviews with them, play on my YouTube nonstop in my room. Yeah. People think that you know it's, it's TV going, but it's literally interviews with with Bud Bodica, with with Ford, with John Houston talking and just listening to their voice, talking about how how they did this and then clips from the movies. Uh, I find that exciting. Uh, I also think it's truly important that the filmmaker watch what your contemporaries are doing. But it's really dangerous territory, especially around a movie, you know. Uh, Cross of Iron, I adored. I loved it. I thought it was uh, there were, maybe, maybe there were some elements. You mean the actual blood squibs and things like that, and the smoke well, behind them? That and also the count. sense of fate, and the sense yeah. that, that, that yeah. it was just that it, yeah, it was... absolutely. I'll take you where the iron crosses grow. That one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a. Uh, uh, I think if there were a comparison of that, is that on this tableau of violence and and and, and uh tiger tanks and, and russian tanks fighting with each other that was a story about two men one man who was a hero but hated it and one man who was not a hero and hated that you know and and, and that you have this whole film you know that is really it's about those two guys and 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 all the rest of it is color to it and, and peckinpah's finest is 
is these this human thing drama original interesting tangible set you know and the blood squibs and the bullet hits and all these falling people falling over that's something that he felt he had a you know fingerprint on but it's that it's that wonderful beautiful thing so if you compare me to peck and Parfait, that is an enormous compliment because at its heart Boudicca is about a mama you know that's what I mean it's for her trying to get yeah. return something back to them and then um and she knows she's not going to escape it she can't no it doesn't matter at that point anyway yeah. she found out where the kids were she's yes. you know, it's all it's you know it's it's all fine we had I had shots in the original script of Prasutagus in his horse galloping and surrounding her and you know seeing her in the battle and she realized he's there and the kids but it all becomes a bit heavy-handed we, we we did it with a little little teeny flashback but yeah it's about you know she's you know she's she, it's she's made her mark by that point she's done what she needed to do uh she's she's honored the, the family and, and, and made payback and and that's what it is you know so hopefully the small story we all are interested in those and people talk about epics all the time make the big vista have all the people there have as many buildings fall down as possible and the superheroes going through it and that would be epic it's not it's not the greatest epics were small stories yes. told on big characters lots of arabia dr shivaga you know uh these were small stories yeah. beautiful almost bordering on soap in many in some respects but but something in the character was slightly different and it was big enough that it could be told on an epic international whole scope it's it, it's you know we get confused by what we're seeing so much with a tentpole movie that has so much money thrown at it that you they the audience you know the, the, the filmmakers feel they need to give the audience their money's worth but the truth we are interested in small stories we're interested in what our neighbor did you know and why 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 have they got you know a different dog now and what happened to the other dog suddenly that disappeared this is more interesting to us than than it, because we are we are human these are stories told around a campfire and the flickering flame on our face is is the is the movie screen you know which brings us to the final question is you're in Italy doing something by the Mediterranean. You can't talk about it, but is is it something we're going to see soon? Is it something that's going to be? It's a, it's a TV show. I've signed an NDA, so I can't talk about it, but I'm in all of the places where Boudicca's enemy would have lived <laughs> <laughs> and, and enjoyed their lives and talked about the troubles in England <laughs> or Britain, as they would have called it, and that, that uh, a faraway isle that actually provided some quite nice gold and tin and you know resources but but uh but yes we we're in magnificent locations i've been through the uh uh dolomite mountain range I, from hungary to the dolomite mountains to southern italy now and go to rome and cinecetta and then up to the grand sasso and monte cassino and then back into hungary so it's a pretty pretty incredible trip although i'm working 14 hour days yelling and shouting and when I get in my hotel room, you just fall asleep under the covers and get up. But it's but it's nice to look out the window at all the people enjoying swimming in the sea. <laughs> well, thank you, Jesse, for taking the time to talk about Boudicca. Thank you for making a brilliant film. Um, I hugely enjoyed it, and I look forward to okay. talking to you about your next things and hope everything goes well in Italy. Thank you very much for a wonderful and kind interview, and I really appreciate the support, and I hope people uh, dig, dig it. They will. If they don't, then something wrong with them. All the very best. Have a great day. Sports Social Podcast Network.